Hello everyone. Um, can I just say that Joe is literally the loveliest person I've ever met in my entire life. As, so look, I've not come onto this stage crying at those nice things he said to me, but he's a friend and I'm delighted to be here. Um, as I was preparing, I was thinking, um, I was thinking about doing something a little bit different. And when I came in, I said to Joe, like, I'm, I'm not talking about KFC really at all. Is that gonna be okay? And he said, well, it's okay. It sold out before anyone knew that you were coming. And so no one had any expectation <laughs> of that as well. Because previously he told me it had sold out, but he hadn't said it had sold out before anyone knew it was me. So I said, that's probably very good for my ego to hear that. Um, so I'm going to talk about something I've never like, really sort of spoken at these sorts of events before. I have got a deck that is like the KFC brand turnaround story. So if anyone wants to see that at another juncture or I can grab my laptop and we can go through that afterwards, um, I'm more than happy to. Um, but I want to do something different. So if, it, if it's interesting and, um, and provoke some conversation, um, then let me know, that'd be, that'd be good. If it's not great, then also let me know and I'll just never talk about this subject. <laughs> Again, and that's why I've caveated like a meandering conversation on brand purpose. Um, and I was walking down, the, like the inspiration was I, was, I was walking down the street, um, um, Regent Street, uh, about three weeks ago, and I saw something that, like, just you know, a, a piece of advertising essentially that I was really sort of surprised me. And I stood there and I looked at it for about 15 minutes, and my husband had disappeared; he'd gone somewhere else. Um, and then he's like, called me like, where are you? I'm like, oh, I'm still stood looking at this piece of advertising. Um, and then it, like, I did a bit of research and I wanted to therefore talk about brand purpose. But two other things happened as well. Um, one was uh, about three months ago, I was in an agency revert with our lead creative agency, Mother London, um, and the strategist, very intelligent, wonderful strategist, um, started to talk about the challenges associated with our purpose brief. And I'm sitting there thinking this was not a purpose brief. So I'm kind of beginning to like scratch, my, scratch the side of my head, get a little bit itchy. And I'm like, I, did you think that this was a purpose brief? Because I thought that this was a, a brief really to say like, here's, all, here's some good stuff the brand's doing, not about our brand purpose. And that sparked a little bit of a debate. And I thought that was quite an interesting conversation. And about three years ago, I went to a workshop in Portland um, in Wyden's offices. At that workshop, we had the CMO of Asia, the CMO of the US, the CMO of um, Australia, CMO of the UK. We had the Wyden team. We had the team from Mother London. We had two separate agency partners, strategic agency partners. And we were gonna sit in a room for three days and write the KFC brand purpose. And needless to say, it was the worst three-day workshop <laughs> I've ever been at in my entire life. Um, we achieved literally nothing um, with all of these talented, smart people. And that's, you know, we weren't starting with a blank piece of paper. A lot of research had been done, but that's because we were trying to write a brand purpose. And so I thought it's a really interesting conversation to have. Um, it feels like it's quite a controversial topic as well. There's, there's a few different schools of thought. I'm not necessarily gonna come with a, a point of view. I'm not trying to kind of bring you around to a, a way of thinking. I just wanna share some of our experiences. Um, but I wanna start by having a little bit of fun. Um, this requires audience participation. So the first question is, does anyone wanna be brave and shout out which brands these purposes are for? And um, some of them are, are probably like spot on because they're published. Some of them are a bit more of a, like an assumption or a guess. I've only got a few, okay? There are no prizes. <laughs> uh, unless, Joe, you've got prizes. No, no, there's, no there's no prizes. No. So the first one is bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. If you have a body, you're an athlete. No. No. Yes. First, very good. I mean, actually, I read a brand purpose of Nike, which was like way back when, which was to make the best running shoes in the world. They, said, they used to say that was their purpose, but this is absolutely Nike's purpose. Most famous. They get progressively harder as well. Um, Although they're not that hard, I thought. I'm not gonna make it really difficult for me, actually. Okay, next one. Help all women realize their personal beauty potential. Dove. Yes, Dove, the, the, the symbol of brand purpose, Dove. Next one, I know that there's gonna be at least four people who get this one as well. Inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. 
Lego, yeah, there was three there. Well done. Um. <laughs> okay, next one. We believe every day should feel as exceptional as the start of a long weekend, comfortable, confident, stress-free, together. Yeah, it's a trick, isn't it? It's a trick. Um, I'm going to come back to this at the end. Um, so I want to start by talking about um, deodorant. I'm not going to talk about Lynx specifically, um, but if you're a deodorant brand, um, you can, you know, like, it may well be that you want to set your brand purpose to be that we are going to make young men feel confident. Um, and that feels like a noble cause. It feels important. It feels like there's stretch within that. And it's relevant to your product proposition, to your position in the market, to the category. Um, maybe that's a good thing to do. I don't know. But what I would say is let's really understand the difference between a brand purpose and a brand position or a campaign idea. Um, links from the early 90s through to 2014 um, had a, a position or a campaign idea which was boy gets girl. Um, and actually, that, like, they were amazingly strict about that. When you hear them talk about it, um, it even, even in like, um, the, the late noughties, um, they never looked at engaging with, say, like LGBTQ plus issues because it was boy, boy gets girl. That was their campaign. They were super strict about it. And then they evolved that over time as it became less relevant. The question is, is to have a campaign idea like boy gets girl, do you need to have a purpose that is help young men feel confident? I would, I would argue that Lynx's purpose is to reduce the impact of body odor. Like that is the purpose of the brand. If, if your purpose is to make every young man feel confident, then your innovation pipeline maybe would look really different. Maybe you should be working on like fashion or exercise regimes or public speaking opportunities. Like if your purpose is to make every young man feel confident. I'm not saying that is Link's purpose. I don't know what their purpose was at that point. Their campaign idea for the time was impactful and it was amazing. Um, but what role does purpose play? Now, you take a piece of work like um, Blood Normal from Bodyform from 2017, like an amazing piece of creative work that um, is absolutely purpose-driven, like a real strong symbol of a brand with a really clear purpose that they developed and that since then they've done amazing work um, kind of following on from this. Question, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not coming with an answer, but question is, does brand purpose allow body form and AMV to make great work? Is it great work because it's purpose-led? Um, I wonder if the reason this is great work is because it's disruptive and it's innovative and it's shocking. Um, and it's highly relevant to the category codes. Now, I'm not saying that purpose therefore isn't important because I think that like, a great brand purpose can inspire creative. Like that's something that, that the brand team wanna get behind, it's something that the agency team wanna get behind, and that is really important. It also creates a sense of kind of camaraderie, that there's an internal sense of being that not only inspires creative, but that gives people purpose. And actually purpose is incredibly important to everyone's role. And so working for businesses that have purpose, I think is essential. Question though is, does brand purpose get us to great work? Or, well, I think, sorry, I think the answer is yes, brand purpose does get us to great work. But does great work require a brand to come with purpose? And I think back to that KFC workshop that I was at, and this sense of like, we need this brand purpose to be able to do great work. And I don't think that was necessarily the case. Um, but I do think that this idea of like being shocking is really interesting. Now, just for fun, I like to show my, my least favorite piece of work in the world, which is Burger King. And I don't like to criticize others' work. I've made lots of poor work as well. Um, and, we all, and it's a learning experience. But Burger King um, awarded an awarded piece of work from Burger King. Maybe it's just because I work for KFC. Um, <laughs> where they showed um, a whopper going moldy um, in stop motion over time. And they had out of home with a picture of a moldy whopper. Um, and really, the reason that this isn't good work, in my opinion, is because our category, um, our kind of the QSR, quick service restaurant category, is built on three things. There are a few others as well, but it, being convenient, being good value, and selling tasty food. And so when you do work 
that fundamentally disregards what it is to be relevant in a category just to be shocking, then it's never going to be successful. Um, so I think that if, if Burger King had had maybe a bit more brand purpose that was relevant to the category, they might have made better work. And I think that a lot of what they do is, is gimmicky and lacks some of that, um, although they are getting much better. Now, um, with watches, one of the things that, um, that, w that we kind of think about is relevance. So it, a brand purpose is important because it's important to our customers. So you know, people care about issues, and if your brand stands behind those same issues, then you'd buy into that brand. Um, and that is why people buy into brands. Like, why do people buy a watch? Because it's not to tell the time, because you could tell the time with a Casio watch for $9.99. Um, you could probably tell the time with something much more affordable than $9.99 even. Um, and then you could buy a Chanel watch for £565, or you could buy a Rolex for anywhere up to hundreds and hundreds of thousand pounds. Um, and when you buy into those brands, it's, it's because by wearing that watch, it says something about who you are. This watch says something about who I am as a person. If I wear a Casio watch for 999, it might be because that's the only watch I can afford, but I think more likely it's because you're saying something. You're saying something which is I reject the kind of Rolex, like high, high end um, sort of symbols of wealth and I just want something functional. You're, you're telling people that you're looking for something functional. It might be that you're telling people about how, like, what you value in life. It might be because you kind of think that's retro and cool and interesting, but it's still a statement about who you are as a person. If I buy into Shinola, it might be because of their story um, about re like regeneration, rejuvenation of Detroit and what they're doing there. Um, but the question I'd, I'd argue is how deeply does a consumer necessarily go into that? How much do they understand about Shinola and the kind of broader company that they're a part of? Um, or if I buy a Rolex, you know, there's lots and lots of things that I might be trying to say, but probably the main thing is I want people to know I'm really rich. And so, <laughs> Although purpose can absolutely lead to relevance, we know that there are, like now more than ever, a load of issues that are really, really important to people um, that relate to brand purpose. Um, that's only one way to be relevant, and there are lots of other ways to be relevant. So I guess I'm saying that purpose can equal relevance, but in order to be relevant, you don't need to have brand purpose. Now, that's not to say for one moment that you don't need to have a social purpose or a business purpose or all of those sorts of things. Um, absolutely, individuals, people are purpose-led and they're values-led and organizations need to be purpose-led and values-led and brands need to stand for something. But it doesn't necessarily have to be, I don't think, a higher order, doing good in the world brand purpose. Now, um, absolutely the foundations need to be in place and there are many things that brands need to do that they kind of historically weren't doing, which kind of leads me on to the story I want to tell, which is about Abercrombie and Fitch. So um, Abercrombie and Fitch, like, I'm going to assume that people know something of Abercrombie and Fitch, but not loads about Abercrombie and Fitch. So when I was a kid, Abercrombie and Fitch didn't exist in the UK. Um, like many years ago, they opened um, a store on Savile Row. Um, which kind of created quite a lot of controversy. Um, but when I was a kid, it was only in the US. So if people, and also like e-commerce didn't really exist. So if people wore Abercrombie and Fitch in the UK, it was this sort of symbol of like Americana and um, that sort of jock lifestyle that was a huge, huge part of their brand. And if you went to an Abercrombie and Fitch store in the US, outside that store, there would always be a guy who looked like this. <laughs> And sometimes there'd be a scantily clad girl, but there was always a guy who looked like this. Um, so they're quite, like, quite elitist, clearly sort of targeting a, um, a young, good-looking, all-American kind of vibe. Um, their sort of, their kind of target demographic was younger, so it's like sort of 15 to 17, although um, a lot of people who would afford it would be a little bit older. But this sense of like, if you buy Abercrombie & Fitch, this is what you're buying into. This sense of being like all American, 
this sense, like, I think when you put Abercrombie and Fitch on, you feel like your abs have just got a little bit <laughs> tighter and you just look a little bit more like this. Um, and so they were really quite cool, quite aspirational to that very, very specific kind of young male demographic. Now, of course, then they went on to do some terrible things. Um, some really terrible things. So it's important that I am you know, explicit about how we all feel about the terrible things. <laughs> Firstly, it's like, which I hadn't realized until I was researching this, like, like they made some really racist things as well. So they have these American Asian t-shirts um, and they say some really like, some things that are like are borderline racist. It's like Wok and Bowl American Asian t-shirt says something like, um, two Wongs don't make a, a white. Um, because, um, sorry, that was Wong Brothers Laundrette. Like, some really, really poor taste stuff. They also had this, this is really hard to find an image of, but who needs brains when you have these? So they were like, incredibly, like, their this was withdrawn. Really sexist, terrible, terrible stuff. Um, and their, um, their former CEO, Mike Jeffries, said, we hire good-looking people in our stores because good-looking people attract other good-looking people. We want to market to cool, good-looking people. We don't market to anyone else than that. Um, and, um, and Mike Jeffries, um, under his tenure, was obsessed with this strategy. They paid people not, like there was a big like, PR thing, they paid people who were ugly or not cool not to wear Abercrombie and Fitch. Um, and they also hired only models to work in their stores. Um, and that's not just the guys who are standing out front shirtless, it's actually the people who are working in their stores. And there was a case brought against the store in Savile Row um, for a young woman who, um, who was missing one arm, who was asked to only work in the stock cupboard because she wasn't allowed out front, and she won that case. So they're, horrible. they're doing horrible, horrible things. Um, but it was also quite effective for a time, until people caught on, to, caught on to this. Because actually, by being incredibly targeted and creating this cult of Abercrombie um, and making the brand cool and exclusive and aspirational, they were very successful. Um, however, Mike Jeffries resided over 11 quarters of same-source sales decline. So for 11 quarters, the brand was in decline. So it clearly was not working. So to be fully without purpose or in this place that's just incredibly, um, well, I mean, I say racist, sexist, and discriminatory, is, is a terrible place to be. Now, Mike Jeffries was about 75 when he was booted out in 2014 after 11 quarters of decline, and thank goodness. Um, but this is what he said, basically. This was his entire point of view. This was his philosophy. We go after the attractive, all-American kid with a great attitude and a lot of friends. A lot of people do not belong in our clothes, and they cannot belong. Um, now, belonging is one of my personal values. Um, I spent a lot of time in my life feeling like I didn't belong in the world. And so it's really important for me to create an inclusive environment at work, at home, um, and for the brands that I represent. And so for, for the CEO to have this as his philosophy is absolutely atrocious. But what's interesting is their, their current CMO kind of states this, Abercrombie isn't a brand where you need to fit in. It's one where everyone truly belongs. An inclusive and equitable spirit is woven throughout what we do. A total repositioning. And the thing that stopped me in the street was, I don't know if it's still there because it was three or four weeks ago, but outside Abercrombie, they have this image which is on their website, which is these seven people um, on the website, it describes the purpose, the purpose I spoke to at the beginning. Um, and these seven people, um, all of whom work at Abercrombie. And I'd not really been paying any attention to what had been going on. I, I, honestly, I, I still thought they were positioned as that kind of like all-American elitist kind of thing. And I saw this, and I just thought, one, on the one hand, isn't this great progress for Abercrombie to to move from an elitist, um, sexist, racist position to something that is inclusive. Not only do they have a kind of like 
a full like representative um, kind of group of people, all sizes. Um, they also um, kind of um, use pronouns on there as well because all these people work there and they talk about the job that they do and use their pronouns. But my question is whether to move from a positioning that is frankly so elitist and exclusive to a positioning, because this is on their website, this is consumer facing, this isn't business purpose, this is the purpose that they want to communicate, to a positioning that is so broad and exclusive. That turnaround, it's really hard to get your head round as a consumer. So it's a huge leap. Now, I would argue that they needed to make significant inroads, but I wonder if, if actually that is their purpose. And I, I mean, I think that you know, jury's out on whether this is the right thing for them to do. I don't know exactly where their performance is overall now, but I just think that the, the level of transition has been kind of like amazing. Um, so I thought I'd put down a few things that I found helpful and unhelpful, or that I think are helpful and unhelpful when you think about the role that a brand purpose might play. Um, sometimes you might be kind of struggling to go like, do we need one? Are we working on one? Um, sometimes you might be thinking like, we have one and what does it do? And I think that actually, I think that it can be really good. I think that it's helpful if it inspires great creative work. Um, always looking at tight boundaries to drive great creative. So if it does that, it's helpful. If it can make you relevant in culture, then it's helpful. And purpose-led, like consumers are more purpose-led than ever. So having a great purpose, I think, can absolutely play a really credible role there. If it helps encourage consistency, when you've got a clear purpose, it allows your work to be really consistent over time. So that can be amazing. And it has to have longevity. It's something that's meaningful, that can work over and over and over again for years to come. And I think body form are a great example of how purpose has driven the work over many years. I think it's unhelpful when it becomes awards focused. I think you know, winning awards is nice but you absolutely don't want to be doing work in order to win awards. Um, where it can turn you off category codes, I think we've got to be careful. Um, as I say, like in the kind of fictitious deodorant example, like if it takes you beyond what is actually relevant to your consumer or to your category, um, I think we need to be really careful. Um, and then if it becomes attitude over action, I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean there, but if it's more about how you say it than what you say, I think it absolutely needs to be sitting at the core of what you're saying. But I do think that a higher order purpose or socially good is irrelevant. Now, I'm not saying that I think those things are irrelevant to a brand or a business. I'm just saying you can have something that's really helpful that doesn't do those things, and you can have something that's really helpful that does do those things. So it's not to say that if, if social good is baked into a brand, that it should be booted out and that that therefore becomes irrelevant. But if it isn't, it's not necessary in order to make you consistent, to make great work, and to be relevant to your category. Um, so here are just a few final thoughts um, in, or questions you might want to ask to evaluate whether or not the brand purpose that you may or may not have is helpful. So the first thing I think is like, is it what you do every day? Is it actually what your brand does every day? And does the brand play an active role in that to inspire, to innovate, to create, to help, to develop? I mean, I think those first three purposes that I shared are wonderful, helpful, brilliant things from Lego, Dove, and Nike. And you notice how they're all very action orientated. So it's to inspire, it's to develop, it's to create. Um, the, if it is indeed a purpose, the Abercrombie one was, was a belief. And a belief isn't active. And therefore, if you have a purpose, it needs to be active. Um, is it coherent and is it consistent? Um, is it coherent with the, with the product and the ex experience? And are you building it consistently over time? Um, so not a purpose, but um, you know, I think that you know, when we think about the category codes as well, so is your brand purpose relevant to the codes of the category? Um, it, has, it can't be absolutely removed. <laughs> it has to be relevant to the category codes and what you're doing. Um, and it has to make you relevant in culture. So a, like, I think the role of a purpose is to make you relevant in culture. So if it's not doing that, it's never going to work. And then finally, there is a distinction between what you say and how you say it. Um, be really mindful of that distinction. A purpose should be leveraged in conjunction with those things. So if a purpose is, is what you say, if it's who you are and it's what you say, it should be leveraged in conjunction with those things um, that work for your brand. So it's not going to be the same as what we've done, but it can be a feeling, a tone, a personality, 
a lurk, or a combination of all of those things. So, as I said, that, that was a meandering conversation and some reflections on brand purpose. I'm going to stick around for a bit if anyone does have questions or feedback or wants to see the other presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much.